here at our um, at our blog site, like we often do. So um, first off, uh, my name is Wayne Welk. I'm automation specialist with the Reynolds Company in New Orleans, and I'll be doing the presentation today. And I'll be assisted towards the end with uh, Bill Brock, who's our IC industrial uh, control specialist. He'll kind of uh, talk about Ethernet media uh, at the very end. So we got a lot to cover today, and we'll uh, we'll jump right in with some traditional introduction slides that we like to do. Um, so first off, upcoming user group sessions. Uh, we're going to take a break in November, mainly because of the automation fair is uh, is coming up here in, in three weeks, and we're going to touch on that in, in just a slide. And then we'll come back in December, and we'll do what uh, what we're going to call best in show two, which we did best in show last year. We'll do best in show again this year, and that's basically uh, automation fair review. So if you didn't get to go to automation fair, which we hope you do get to go, we will. Um, Bill and I will walk the show, and we'll kind of take notes on what we thought was kind of cool and, and exciting, and kind of a little preview of what's to come in 2018. So we'll do that in December, and then moving into January, we'll uh, continue our users group topics. We've got some dates defined, and topics not quite defined yet, but we kind of have some ideas. We'll 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 kind of cover all of our basis. Uh, we'll do automation. We'll do power. We'll do industrial control topics uh, going into first quarter of next year. So, um, so the big big thing, of course, uh, outside of our topic today is automation fair. It's hard to believe uh, it's three weeks from today that it'll start. So um, we're. Uh, Desperately uh, asking everybody to sign up now. Uh, don't wait to the last minute. If you still want to, you know, even if you're not quite sure if you can make Automation Fair, but you're kind of on the fence still, just go ahead and sign up and um, get your name on the list. It's totally free to attend. Um, you know, uh, n there's no fee to, to go to the show. Of course, travel and expenses, uh, you know, not included there if you got to get to Houston. The Reynolds Company does offer a travel package with hotel and flight arrangements and ground transportation. So if you um, if you do want to go and want some travel arrangements, talk to your um, account manager with the Reynolds Company for that. I had a couple of slides that uh, uh, Rockwell share with me. Um, one is the uh, Process uh, Solutions Users Group (PSUG) is um, is the first two days of that week. And they're still extending the early, early bird uh, pricing through, I guess that must be Friday, the 27th. So uh, if you do want to go to the, to the process uh, PSUG, um, again, that's, there's, a, there's a charge to that part of it. So you can um, take advantage of the early bird pricing still for a couple more days. Um, this was a picture of the show floor. So just to show if you have never been to Automation Fair, you know, it's a huge uh, ex, you know, exhibit floor. You know, with all of um, Rockwell, very you know, obviously Rockwell's prominently featured. Those with all the big red squares, and then all the other booths are all the Encompass partners and the uh, partner network that Rockwell has, all in that one room together. So that's one of the values of the Automation Fair is you've got everybody in the in the room together at once. You can meet a lot of people, meet a lot of the uh, product managers, marketing managers, um, all the experts from the various Encompass partners. So. Um, very, uh, very nice uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, there will be the uh, what's called the Connected Enterprise Pavilion, and uh, here in the room, our slides definitely lagging a few minutes behind. But for the web, the uh, Connected Enterprise Pavilion is um, basically it will show you know the Connected Enterprise in action on the showroom floor. So they'll actually it will have. Um, you know, like a lax skid and a compressor, apparently, and some wellhead and a um, and some packaging, food and bev packaging stuff. So that's going to be interesting to see that as well. So what's kind of new? Um, some there'll be a lot of new products highlighted uh, at the show, and uh, um, so this is a little taste of what's coming on the hardware side. You've got the the new Logics Compute module. Uh, the new 5480 Compact Logics, the new Flex 5000, which is a brand new um, Flex Remote I/O product with gigabit Ethernet speed, and the uh, Parallel Redundancy Protocol module for the Control Logics. So we'll actually show that today, as well as some some software stuff too. Um, there on the right-hand side. 
And last but not least, uh, we'll see you in Houston. So George R. Brown Convention Center. So again, uh, three weeks away, so uh, kind of our, our last uh, call to get, get registered and, and head on over to Houston. So with that, we'll go into today's topic, which is uh, demystifying industrial Ethernet networking. Um, you know, it's October and Halloween's a week away as well, and so uh, you know, a little mysterious topic, right? The demystifying. So first thing you say is, well, you know, hey, what's there to demystify, right? You you buy a switch, you put it in the panel, and you you put the Cat5 cable to it, right? What else is there to do? Um, and that was probably, uh, you know, that sufficed for for some time, right? But as we see the uh, the convergence, as we, you know, the, the OT, IT convergence again, as we see, you know, networks becoming more and more, you know, uh, enterprise, um, you know, connected. You just can't buy the switch and connect the Cat5 into anymore, so a little more to it. So um, so we'll kind of cover a couple, you know, a few things. Kind of first go over to Stratix portfolio. We have to at least kind of introduce the Stratix portfolio, at least the key pieces that, that kind of play into our discussion today. Um, and we'll talk about the converged plant-wide Ethernet, the CPWE concepts, and go into the resilient network design. Uh, some ideas, you know, around the resilient network. That's something that we, we get a lot of um, questions about um, nowadays. And then we'll wrap it up a little bit at Ethernet media at the end, because there's, you know, some good things to cover there. So what we're not going to cover today is how we kind of configure the Stratix switch. Uh, we did that before, and it's been a while, I'll admit, it was January 2016, but from our archives, you can go back, and if you want to learn more about how you actually get into a Stratix switch, and how you configure it, and how you, you know, set up a VLAN, how you set up NAT, how you do those kind of things, we covered all that um, back in January 2016, so we got a link right here, um, which we'll share after the show, we'll put it on our blog, and our show notes, um, you, can, um, you can come back and watch that topic. All right, so first, Stratix. What's the Stratix, um, you know, what's the Stratix line? So Stratix is, uh, is the kind of the, the marketing name or the product family name of the industrial Ethernet products. And it's a, um, it's a, uh, a joint effort between Cisco and Rockwell. So Cisco brings their expertise in the IT world and, and their networking expertise, and Rockwell kind of layered in their industrial you know, operations technology world and their knowledge from the from the plant floor, and kind of brought that into a uh, industrial hardened um, line of Ethernet products, and they cover everything from switches and um, all the way up to wireless and uh, and even firewall type appliances. So a couple of slides to just kind of talk about the value, and again, that's kind of what you know we just talked about was. Uh, you know, um, Rockwell, you know, so Rock, Rock, Rockwell, again, brought the, uh, the OT knowledge and Cisco brought to the table their, their um, depth and breadth of uh, IT solutions. And that, of course, brings that collaborative um, engagement that, you know, we really needed on the plant floor. So a couple of slides first on that, on the value of the Stratix for you, and we'll show some of the products here. And first is in the design phase. Um, you know, the, the idea here is that everything we do, and we talk about the CPWE here in a, in a bit, and these are, um, you know, uh, characterized architectures. They're, they've been tested, um, documented, you know, if you, they're validated, well, I should have said there, so you can actually, you know, take that design guide, you can take these things and you can put it together in that way, and, and you know you get known results out of it. Um, there are custom add-on profiles and add-on instructions, which will uh, help you in the uh, coding and the configuration and the just getting information out of the Stratix switch. Um, and then there's a, even the offline tool, which uh, we'll picture of it there in the bottom right. That's an integrated architecture builder or the Ethernet capacity tool as well. So you can actually use free tools from Rockwell to help build your network ahead of time, kind of lay it out, and even see what some of the expectations are on that network, like in here, you can see some segments are green, and the little pop-up bubble there on that network, telling you kind of what to expect on that leg. You know, what kind of traffic would you expect on that leg, based on the conditions you kind of define in the software. Uh, next value is kind of the um, 
the build phase. So, you know, you have the ability to um, to daisy chain, uh, do a device level ring. Um, the um, the OT centric distributor supports. That's kind of us. But a little, little uh, plug to us is that you know we as a distributor partner of Rockwell, you know we understand this stuff, um, and we can help you you know kind of sort through the networking piece and the and the products that you would need. Um, it's o it's optimized for the OT again. OT being an operational technology people, it's optimized for the OT people. So you don't have to be the IT person. You don't have to have a Cisco certification to get in and understand this um, product. You can um, you know you can get in with the Studio 5000 add-on profile um, stuff. Hold on. So. Um, I didn't know if that was someone trying to get a hold of me there or not. So the um, and then the last piece was network address translation. So that's that's kind of nice for the bill because if you're a uh, if you're an end user, you don't necessarily have to worry about if your OEM is is giving you IP addresses. You, don't, you know they can just give you a SCID and you can kind of use a NAT to translate over into their SCID. Or if you're the OEM, you don't have to necessarily have to worry about working out all the IT details with your end customer. You say, here's my SCID. You know, here's my IP addresses. You just map over with your uh, NAT device. The uh, deploy phase. Um, two two kind of interesting things here. Uh, one is uh, secure digital card support. So you can quickly take all your switch configurations and you can put them onto a secure digital card and you can bring that card to a uh, to a new switch and drop the configuration into a new switch. You can kind of rapidly deploy. Um, all that switch configuration that way, um, or backup switch configuration out of an existing switch, and uh, HMI faceplates. So um, there are a, uh, a library of faceplates that Rockwell provides on their um, software download site, and um, you can uh, you can get a lot of Stratix uh, details out of there, such as uh, switch status and port status. Um, and this would work inside of a panel view or a uh, Factory Talk View SC. And a uh, little, little different, uh, just some additional pictures of those, those face, face plates look like, some bigger pictures of them. But you can kind of see, you know, port status again. Um, and then that one uh, with the, you can actually get your device level ring um, uh, information out of there as well. Display your ring in a face plate. And the last one is maintain. So again, kind of showing that that uh, device level ring faceplate once again. So you can use the um, the tools, the the faceplate to help you maintain your network. See the again, see the status and the health of your network. Monitor it and alarm on it, um, as well as uh, technical support. So Stratix switches are covered under your Tech Connect uh, support agreement, and um, a lot of. Uh, the, auto de the uh, middle there, auto device configuration and replacement. So you can actually, um, you know, set up your Stratix switch to automatically deploy uh, an IP address, a DHCP uh, persistence to that to that device, as well as uh, drop your configuration uh, of a device. For instance, a drive. If you if you had to replace a drive uh, middle of the night, you could have it to where when you put the drive in, the switch automatically assigns the IP address to that switch based on the port you just plugged it into. And then, of course, the control logics can send the drive configuration down to that drive as well, automatically. And you didn't have to take any software or any laptop out or any kind of programming or downloading to make that happen on your own. And uh, last, uh, last little column there is testing. So you know everything has been functionally tested and characterized, again, by Rockwell. So you know when these products you know, have been all set up in a lab and tested. And uh, and uh, are known to work if you if you uh, apply them in the right way. All right. So um, again, uh, I, this is worth discussing because we still get questions at times. You know, managed versus unmanaged switch. Uh, so the key, you know, this was a good slide I would found um, from Rockwell that kind of gave it in some simple bullet forms. So managed switch, the advantages you get some, uh, you know, you get a lot of um, Diagnostics, you get loop prevention, you get security pieces, you get the ability to do segmentation with VLANs, um, you get the quality of service, 
you know, prioritization services, resiliency protocols, uh, multicast. And the disadvantage, of course, is it's going to cost more for a managed switch. And there, there is some setup and configuration required there, right? So a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of work to get it going. Whereas the unmanaged switch is, of course, you know, inexpensive and it's rather simple, right? You just take out the box and you plug it in. But what you don't get out of that, of course, is all the advantages of the managed switch. You don't get loop prevention. You don't get security services. You don't really get a whole lot of diagnostics out of an unmanaged switch, and um, and no resiliency capabilities either. So. So we still see managed, unmanaged switches being used, and there's, I guess, a time and a place for unmanaged switch. But I think most of the time, we would highly recommend a managed switch um, anytime you're, you're putting together an automation system, industrial control system. So uh, next slide is a full overview of the Stratix uh, kind of switch portfolio. So the, the, the 2000 is the unmanaged switch product. Um, 5 to 16 port. But now we have something new. It's called the lightly managed, and that's the Stratix 2500, and that's a 5 and an 8 port. And we'll, we'll show that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Uh, and then moving up the line, you got the 6000, which is a, you know, a managed, and then the 5700, which is really kind of our, our, our kind of lead in on the managed product, kind of what we would go with in a, in a lot of cases in, in a managed switch opportunity. Um, comes in various sizes with various capabilities um, and uh, brings in the, uh, you know, all the full managed switch capabilities. And there's the 8000, the 8300, which could be layer 2 or layer 3, with, you know, layer 3 meaning routing versus uh, layer 2, just kind of an access uh, layer switch. Um, and then up to the 5400, which is a, uh, can be layer 2 or layer two, 3, all gig. And then the 5410, which is a a rack mount distribution type switch, which does offer layer two support uh, as well as layer three routing, and it's all gig and including a few uh, 10 gig ports as well. So we're going to kind of highlight the the 5700, 5400, and 5410 here in just a second, in addition to the 2500. All right. So uh, so first, 2500. This is a, this is a new product. Um, just came out in the last uh, couple months. This, of course, will be highly, uh, you know, this will be shown at Automation Fair. Probably, you know, definitely one of the new new products that I'll, I'll want to highlight. So, again, the unmanaged switch is just, you know, simple, right? Connecting devices. Uh, whereas the lightly managed switch, as this is being referred to, does give you the, uh, you know, managed switch, some managed switch capabilities, but at a price point that is definitely lower, you know, closer to the, to the unmanaged switch um, product. So what can you do with it? You can definitely do, uh, you can do, you know, loop. You, it does, it supports spanning trees. So you can do some loop prevention. It does some quality of service um, for prioritization. You could do segmentation with VLANs. And you can definitely uh, improve your security posture, as it says there, and with some network uh, security features like port security um, for connections to your network. Uh, different slide that kind of says some of those things again right here. So um, it does support the add-on profile again. So you can you can bring in the um, you know, bring in the switch data and, and do your configuration through Studio 5000 with the add-on profile. It does support the faceplate. There's a faceplate for it. Um, and uh, again some of the things we just talked about a minute ago, VLAN as well. Um, secure connections, HTTPS and um, Topology discovery and uh, again spanning tree for your loop protection. So moving up to the uh, fully managed switch, right? So um, you know, so now you know the, the lightly managed switch isn't quite uh, you know where you need if you need to go fully managed. Then we move into the uh, 5700 family, which comes in um, various configurations, a uh, few different sizes. 6, 10, 18, 20 port base units. Uh, you got some gig port options. You got SFP ports for fiber, direct fiber connections. Um, you got a secure digital card again for that, uh, that configuration uh, data. Um, you could do some PoE, power over Ethernet out of the switch. Um, dual inputs for power, you know, for power. So you can have uh, uh, you know, two separate power supply feeds coming in. 
uh, as well as some alarms. The, um, the, some of the differentiators for the 5700 is that it does include uh, DLR, device, device level ring uh, connectivity. So certain models, not all models, and we'll sh discuss that in a minute, uh, is that you can, certain models, uh, 10 ports on up allow for DLR capability. Uh, but you gotta be careful and when you're ordering your, your switch that you, you pick DLR if you, if you want that support. So you can actually use the 5700 in the device level ring um, itself, which is the only switch that uh, can, that can can go in there. Um, redundant gateway capabilities, so you can you can also um, you know do as you're shown in this picture here. You got two 5700 switches um, sitting there. One is an active, one is a back backup. We'll, we'll definitely show some resiliency architectures in a bit. Uh, enhanced security, so again, protecting the machine as well as protecting the plant. So, you know, you could do things like, um, um, you know, controller-based port control on and off. You can do uh, unauthorized device identification per port. And uh, you could do uh, MAC ID authentication, so you can really lock that thing down to where if it doesn't recognize the MAC ID, of the device that's being plugged into it, it's not going to allow it. Um, and then on the plant side, you can, you know, there's a, you know, encrypted, uh, encrypted capabilities, and uh, pass, you know, multi multiple layers of password protection, access control lists, right, to to kind of enforce your security policies. So um, this uh, chart is um, really just to show you that. You know what happens a lot of times is uh, we'll get a call or we'll get a, a you know a spec and it just says uh, give me a 5700 switch and you're like great but uh, there's a lot of things we have to you know there's a lot of options uh, to it so um, the main things that to know is this chart is really what I, what we'll always come to as well and kind of figure out all the permutations of the part number uh, of course there you know number of ports. The types of ports, right? Do you want the SFP slots? Um, make sure I have my computer rebooting there. <laughs> uh, SFP slots, combo ports, you know, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet. That's the FB is fast Ethernet, GE is uh, gigabit Ethernet. And then the uh, moving in the chart is light or full uh, software type. We'll, we'll have a we'll show that next. And you can see the little dots at the bottom. So right, all the switches from basically. Um, you know, the 10 port, um, you know, the CGP version all the way down support DLR. And you have a few that are uh, NAT capable and a few that, uh, that do the SIP sync. So just take a look at this chart and uh, make sure you kind of spec out the right one um, because the, uh, you know, once you kind of pick it and buy it, um, you'll be kind of stuck in that, in that particular model, of course. Then um, next kind of thing to think about on the 5700 would be your software features. And they sell two versions, the light and the full. Um, we typically, if it's not specified to us, we'll, we'll probably always go with the full as our, as our default just because, you know, it gives you everything and, and, and we didn't really, you know, we don't really know. So we'll go with the full version. Um, the light is good, but, you know, there's definitely things you can't do in the light. Like you can't do flex links. You can't do quality of service, um, can't do ether channel, um, you don't really have the Mac uh, ID port security. So um, a lot of times, you know, we the full is really what you you probably want. Um, and we'll talk about flex links and ether channel here. That's part of our resiliency discussion and why that, that might be something of interest to you. Um, if you were to buy the light version, and came back to us later and said, hey, I want to flash it up to full. Um, that's not something that we could probably easily do. It would, it would take a little involvement with Rockwell and maybe even having to send it back to the factory. So, um, and there's a cost difference, of course, between light and full. So, so again, we kind of recommend that you, um, you, know, pick out the, uh, you know, pick out the version you want up front. 5400, so stepping up to uh, an all gig switch. 
this guy looks a lot like the 5700 a minute ago, but this is an all gig uh, platform. And uh, we talked about it earlier, it could be either layer two or layer three, depending on how you, you spec it out when you, when you buy it. Um, and this is how you would spec it out, right? So you've got the um, several part numbers to choose from. Uh, again, um, based on ports and types of ports and you know, gig and fast ethernet combinations and the firmware. So in this case, there's not really a you know, flight and a full, but here it is gonna be more of a, if it's a layer two or a layer three. And again, layer three basically meaning you got routing capability between um, at the distribution layer, you know, kind of routing between two different networks or multiple networks, where the layer two is, doesn't have that routing capability and would just be kind of an access switch, you know, kind of within a cell cells area of a, of a plant or all the same network essentially. And uh, the last switch we'll kind of highlight here for this discussion will be the 5410. And this is our uh, distribution switch, an industrial distribution switch, 19-inch uh, rack mount. So you can see it's a totally different look and feel. That's a rack mount guy. Um, again, it's all gig with some 10 gigabit port capability as well. So um, again, it's it's uh, designed for the plant floor. It's rugged. Um, it's a rugged distribution switch. Uh, and it's used mainly as a centralized point for your network, right? So the idea of the distribution switch is all your access switches kind of come up in the distribution switch, distribution switch, and from there it might either get routed to other networks or even up to the next layer up uh, in your enterprise. Um, they said, you know, typical applications, water, oil and gas, pulp and paper, but obviously, uh, you know, it's used all throughout uh, any kind of industrial control application, not just those three. Uh, not quite as many permutations here, but there are a few options uh, based on, again, if you want this to be at a layer two or a layer three version, um, they're pretty much all 28 ports, and then you have some that offer the, uh, uh, the, the 10, gig, 10 gigabit ports, and some that are just all 16, you know, all just gigabit ethernet ports. So, and then this guy does offer an AC power supply option as well. So, because again, this a lot of times this guy is sitting in a rack. Of course, since it's 19 inch rack mount, it could be sitting in a rack inside of a control room. So, so you do have an AC power supply option here. All right. So those are kind of the, the pieces of the puzzle that we'll discuss as we kind of go forward. Um, there are a lot more to the Stratix, you know, a lot more products of the Stratix line beyond beyond that, but. But for our uh, discussions today, we'll, that's kind of what we'll, we were going to focus on. Um, kind of next step is this configuration. So um, configuration tools. Uh, so what makes the uh, Stratix line um, pretty powerful? And again, we I, I mentioned it earlier, and we you've heard it from Rockwell before, is that that OT IT OT or OT IT convergence, uh, depending on your what side of the fence you're on, you say first. Uh, OT, again, being the uh, automation professionals, the operational guys, you know, those of us on the call, basically. And uh, the IT professionals being the, uh, you know, your traditional Cisco IT guys. So that the, all the products we just discussed can be configured using um, all the Cisco tools, you know, right? So if you're a Cisco guy, you're the IT guy, you can go in there with um, command line interface, CLI, or you can use uh, CNA, which is a Cisco network. Um, analyzer, or I think it stands for, uh, or other Cisco tools, right? But, you know, us OT guys and girls, we don't really know that stuff, right? We're not Cisco trained, typically. We may not know all those uh, things. So we're, we're used to the things in the, in the top here, right? Um, we, we're used to Studio 5000. We're used to um, Factor Talk with the face plates. And uh, of course, you can use Device Manager, which is just a web interface. So that's not even having anything, right? Just a Chrome or Internet Explorer or Firefox uh, browser to log in and, and configure the switch. So that's kind of the uh, so the so the, the first uh, the route. And again, we said we had a user group from a while back, so this goes in more detail. But this is just a quick little refresh on that. 
Um, so every switch is a, an express setup. You kind of take out the box, you do a, a little express setup on it, a little paper clip to kind of get in this express setup mode, and you can kind of configure its um, IP address through express setup. And then smart ports are basically uh, predefined port settings that you can give. You don't have to give those settings to those ports, but if you want to, you could say port one is a um, you know is going to be a controller type of you know device, and it'll configure the port and optimize the port based on the expected traffic uh, that would come to a to a logics controller. Or you could set it up as a um, engineering workstation port, perhaps. So it might optimize that port based on uh, what, what would happen on an engineering workstation. So you can define those smart ports um, on the switches. The add-on profile, we've mentioned a couple times. So uh, Studio 5000, you can grab the add-on profile, bring it in, and now when you bring your switch into, when you add your switch to your ethernet tree in the configuration, all that switch data, all that data or all that information, um, all that configuration settings are now accessible from Studio 5000, and you can configure the switch through one tool, Studio 5000, so now you can do your automation, your logics controllers, you can do your switches, um, all in that one tool. Also, all the diagnostic tags and other kind of information tags come into the uh, controller tags uh, of, the, of the logics controller as well, so, so all those um, diagnostic tags are right there, ready to be used. Um, next is uh, CNA, which is again, uh, oh, uh, I was close, I said analyzer, Cisco Network Assistant. Uh, so that's a, that's a Cisco tool, of course. It's totally free, you can go download it off the Cisco's website, and uh, it's just another way to kind of do the same thing, kind of get you uh, into, the, uh, into the network, lets you see the, the switches available, you can kind of drill down in that switch and you can get, uh, you know, configure it, you can get diagnostic data, um, do some troubleshooting perhaps, so you can kind of do some, some uh, maintenance and configuration from that tool. So you have a lot of flexibility is the key to all this. Um, you uh, you know you can you can use combinations of all those tools. I've I've used command line interface before. Um, I've used device manager. I've used AOP. So there's times when um, you might use all three of those or multiple tools to do to, to configure that switch. Um, and last but not least on the configuration side is uh, something brand new, and that's a a, a USB console cable. Which um, so if you do command line interface, you would have to plug into the console port of the Stratix uh, switches. Console port kind of looks like an Ethernet port. It's an RJ45 connector, but it's a uh, a serial connection in. It allows you to use um, hyper terminal or I guess PuTTY too. You can use you know one of those kind of hyper terminal type tools. Log into the switch and do command line interface with it. So in the past, it was a serial cable. And nobody has a serial port, of course, so you'd have to use the little USB to serial adapter. But now Rockwell and uh, Cisco have come out with a USB cable, so we actually have one in the room um, that uh, here to show. But on the web, that's what it looks like, right? So uh, it's a nice, uh, nice cable to have if you're going to be doing uh, Stratix uh, configurations and deployments. All right, moving on. Uh, converge plant-wide plant -wide Ethernet, CPWE. So that's kind of the um, terminology that Cisco Rockwell has kind of used to kind of talk about this whole, you know, how you kind of put the network together, right? So he said in the beginning, wasn't it as simple as just buy a switch and put Cat5 on it and call it a day and, you know, we're all happy. So, um, so you know, the Connected Enterprise, that's been, uh, Rockwell, you know, has been discussing that for years. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely a reality uh, of, of bringing plant data from, you know, from plant four up to the enterprise level. And, of course, um, you know, the idea is, you know, you, you just can't, you just can't do that. You just can't have a switch. You've got to think about the whole, the whole system, the whole infrastructure or the whole, um, you know, um, the whole architecture, because you know what you do down here, just at the ground level, could greatly impact what happens up at the enterprise level, 
if it wasn't done properly. So, you know, the idea here is that, um, you know, Rockwell has kind of seeked out, you know, all the right partnerships, right? So, um, and, and having the Cisco partnership is, is, really, uh, is really important because, you know, Cisco is, is definitely renowned for their networking piece and their use all throughout the, you know, enterprise networking. So it was good to bring that technology to the plant for. So what does that mean? Um, basically, like we said before, that everything, so first off, there's a, a design implementation guide, and I have it linked on the web. It's, it's, it's one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, handouts. It'll be on the, the show notes uh, on the blog after as well. But it's about a 500-page, you know, it's a 500-page document design implementation guide that, that really talks about how to go through and, and, and do all this and defines what all these things are and talks and actually gives all the, you know, tested and validated uh, characteristics of the network. So that, that's always been the key to this is that it's not just, hey, we think if we put these switches, this, you know, it's going to work. This has all been validated and tested um, to work. So that's, that's why this design implementation guide and this, this architecture reference is um, is really important to to see and do if you plan on, you know, if you plan on really designing out a, a network to really take the time to kind of look through this this design guide and um, and see how it how it's recommended and it's been kind of again validated by uh, Cisco and Rockwell. Um, so the idea is, you know, it's built on, uh, you know, it's future ready, right? So, you know, you're the, the whole idea of, the, of, of Ethernet in general is that you're 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 future-proofing your network, you know, versus some of the older proprietary networks that have been out there in the past. And if you design it in the right way, you can expand and you know scale it up, and you're future-ready essentially. Um, again, like we've said before, it's relevant to both the uh, operations technology folks on the planet floor and the enterprise IT guys. They're going to, you know, when they see this diagram, you know, they're going to understand the pieces parts. And as we as the OT guys start to learn more and more with the IT side, you know, these diagrams, like you kind of see there, make more sense as well. And um, again, um, deliverables, uh, there's, so again, there's lots of references and lots of uh, white papers out there. Um, we're going to share a lot of this stuff with you guys, but there's, you know, all kinds of design guides on how to deploy firewalls, how to deploy, how to deploy um, industrial uh, DMZs, um, how to deploy resiliency. So we'll kind of share a lot of this information. So this is the, um, the logical framework. So at first, you know, if you're not familiar with this drawing, it, it could look a little intimidating, um, but it's kind of broken down by uh, by three layers, shall we say. Um, first being the operational technology layer. So this guy in the bottom here, this is kind of what, again, what everybody on this call and in this room, this is what we kind of live in day in and day out. This is kind of where we, we really understand this piece of it. Um, going up a layer is what's kind of referred to as the um, industrial IT zone. This is uh, something that we may not be that familiar with, but we're starting to become much more you know, we're starting to see ourselves move into this space a lot more uh, than we ever have in the past. And last but not least is the traditional information technology IT layer. And this is probably where we're not still going to really play with, you know, play in a whole lot, but this is getting into the true business uh, network, um, you know, parts of the enterprise. But as you can see in this diagram, you know, it's recovering from the top to the bottom um, fully here, and, and again, showing you how, how, this, how this can all kind of come together. So we'll kind of break down some of these things a little bit better. First off, the, um, you know, the kind of that, that layer one area, that operational side. So, um, you know, first off, if you're not familiar with the little blue diagrams and blue boxes, uh, a lot of these are like Cisco um, uh, symbols for their switches and all. So, so this little box, you know, the little small flat box with the four um, arrows, is a, is essentially a industrial uh, switch access switch. Whereas the, um, the the cube with the red dot and the arrows going out, that's a distribution switch uh, symbol. 
So what's happening here, and, and we'll break into each one of these, we're getting there still, is uh, you've got the different cell areas, you know, zones, so we've got a zone one, zone two, zone three, this could be a plant floor, right, so you could have different areas of the, of the facility, right, it could be different buildings, it could be different, just, you know, it could be different lines within the same building, um, but each one of these is kind of segmented into their own, you know, kind of unique areas, and then they're kind of showing three different topologies here, you know, the, the first box being a, a star topology or a redundant star, um, second being a ring in, in zone two, and zone three just being a, a good old flat, um, you know, kind of kind of a linear topology with maybe a little bit of starring going off there too, right? So, so a lot of flexibility in how you do your topology at this layer. So moving up to the next layer, you know, so now we're kind of got the, you know, the data down here again is this is kind of your, your access layer, your, your, your devices, controllers. And now we're starting to get up into a little bit more distribution layer. And um, I wanted to sh at least kind of show you some of the Cisco products at this point because they're referred to in that design implementation guide and they're definitely referred to in that resiliency guide. And just to kind of make you aware of what, you know, kind of what these switches are. So, so when you get to this next level, you start to hear things like this, you know, distribution sta uh, switch stack. Um, so that's kind of your catalyst, right? So that's the that's a, this is a Cisco product, not a not a Stratix product. So a Cisco Catalyst 3850. That could be it's a layer three distribution switch. Um, you'll hear the term stackwise. So stackwise is a um, you know it, it allows you to uh, you can put you know nine switches can be linked together uh, and kind of manage as one single switch. So we see that, you know, we see this Catalyst 3850 kind of being used now here in, in this in this middle layer, at, at those kind of where we circle the two uh, two layer the, the two switches at. Moving up to the next layer is kind of the core switch. So at the core switch core switch layer, um, you'll get the Catalyst 4500, which is a layer three distribution core switch. Um, also, in that same space, you could use what's the, the Catalyst 6800, which is another core switch, um, kind of their flagship uh, switch. And this one, I guess, a uh, little different because it allows for some virtual uh, switching systems, the VSS capability as well. So you'll kind of see those two perhaps at this layer. So again, this is kind of where we're starting to see ourselves at. Now, I'm not going to highlight anything above those core switches right now, but Cisco has, of course, products for all that. So you got, you know, the, the next layer up in the DMZ is some firewalls. So, that, you know, Cisco has a ASA, um, their firewall appliance. And then you're getting up here again, probably another layer of core switches, and then you get into, like, identity services, and they, they have appliances for all that at that, at that enterprise le level, too. But we're going to kind of, I wanted to kind of focus today mainly on the, uh, distribution, kind of middle distribution and on, and on down. So where we um, start to see ourselves really, when we do system design, a lot of things seem to um, go after this campus model, uh, which is referred to in several Cisco documents. Um, and it's just kind of where we see ourselves uh, architecting systems. So the idea of the campus model is, uh, is you know, you have this access layer, which again is kind of our, where, where we're at every day, you know, you know within, within the, the, the facility on the equipment in the cells and the zones of the facility. So that's your layer two. And again, the access switch um, aggregates, right? So it, basically the access layer is kind of aggregating all your industrial control system equipment at that layer. So all your PLCs, drives, robotics, you know, robots and stuff kind of all aggregating at that layer. Next layer up is distribution. So that's your layer three, and that's aggregating all your access switches, right? So every, all your different access switches throughout the facility might be kind of aggregating up into this distribution switch now. And then going up the next layer, uh, your core switch would be, would basically be aggregating all your distribution switches um, together. So we see this is a pretty pretty common model. And then um, next slide we'll uh, 
kind of shows a little bit different um, way of doing it. So um, if you were to uh, look at our plant PAX, which is our, uh, our DCS, our, our modern DCS um, system application of our, of our equipment, you'll see that right in, in the, in the, in the um, uh, design guide is what I'm trying to think of here. So in the plant PAX design guide, you'll see this picture. I just copied it right out of the book. And that is basically the campus model um, is what they're kind of showing, right? So you've got your, uh, you kind of got your 5410s, a pair of 5410s at this layer, and then another pair of 5410s at a layer below. And then, of course, you've got your 5700s where all the equipment kind of comes into. And then, um, so at this, so at this point, we, we often get a lot of, you know, questions is, you know, our, my application is not that really big. Why do I really need four 5410 switches in this application? And the answer is you, you, you don't, you know, in the right circumstances. And then uh, the picture to the right is what's called a collapsed core or a collapsed uh, distribution and core model. So you can take that campus model and you can kind of collapse the core and distribution into one switch. So you could actually remove you know, this top layer of 5410s and just kind of hold uh, you know, one pair of 5410s here. So again, so you know, it's not just a drawing in a book. You know, this is how we actually deploy um, you know, that architecture in our, uh, in our, you know, our DCS applications. And uh, another, I thought this was kind of a, a nice little show and tell on the campus model too was, um, you know, kind of how you put that together. So, you know, the first column here is kind of the undesirable, right? In this case, there was no, um, there was no redundant link between the distribution layer, right? So you basically, you got two distribution switches and they're kind of crisscrossed. But if you broke here, you know, where the red, you know, if you had a break here, then you know, you kind of have to, you're kind of forced back and around and through. So it's not the most desirable app, uh, situation. The middle drawing at least has that link now going between the two distribution switches. So it's a little more acceptable. And the last one is, of course, the best case scenario where you're, you've got kind of a dual link going between the distribution switch layer and then the crisscross pattern going between the core to the distribution. And now you've got the, um, you know, kind of your best avenue for recovery based on a, uh, if a link were to go down. So another place where we actually see this being used in, you know, in the real world is uh, in our, you know, Intel, you know, IntelliCenter MCCs, our, our uh, you know, the, the Ethernet enabled uh, MCCs. So you're going to see in this application, we've got a couple of different uh, cell zones, you know, happening here and a few different topologies going on each one. So we've got, you know, zone one's kind of the, the flat, you know, um, network, linear network. Uh, zone two is your kind of a star, redundant star out to the switch and then a star topology to the devices. And then we see our MCC, you know, zone three, where we have a, a link down to the 5700. And then you can see how now we go into the MCCs and we have, you know, 5700s throughout the, uh, the, the MCC sections, and we distribute out star to our um, to our devices in there. Going uh, to an, one layer beyond, in our kind of package power solutions, you know, we have MCCs, but now we might actually have some switch gear in there, and even maybe some IEC 61850 um, type of devices. So with a with a uh, linking device, we can get into our uh, you know. Um, protective relaying and our smarter breakers and stuff and bring all that information back uh, into the uh, into the plant system. And uh, I realize I'm probably way behind on time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's jump ahead to resiliency. We're actually uh, not not too bad off actually. So uh, we get a lot of, we were now into um, a lot of discussions on resiliency and uh, how we, how we kind of, you know, architect systems, you know, a lot of specs come in. I got to have dual this and dual that. So, um, so it's, here's a quick intro into some of that. So again, two types of ways to go here, right? Switch level 
networking and device level networking. So switch, as I've just been showing, you know, switch level, star, ring, linear, and device level is basically we don't have to have a switch. It's it's networking between the devices themselves. So uh, no no switch is required. Um, daisy chain, right? So we'll start with the um, we'll first start with this chart, and that's all. So this is kind of a bunch of different res resiliency protocols, right? So, um, so first off, you know, the most common one, perhaps, which pretty much every switch will do, is some kind of spanning tree, right? So the idea here is that spanning tree is, although it's common, you know, it's convergence time, meaning convergence time, meaning how fast does it take to detect and recover from an event, is pretty slow. Um, so greater than 250 milliseconds. Now that's being pretty fair because, quite honestly. If you look at some of the charts on spanning tree, it could be several seconds um, to recover. So, an industrial control application, several seconds is is not a good, not a good thing at all. Um, so, one better from that is uh, REP, which is the Ring Resilient uh, Ethernet Protocol, Ether Channel, and Flex Links. So, um, those are better. Those are you know within. 60 to 100 milliseconds, so that's 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 good, but the best is device level ring, so it's got the best and the fastest convergence time, uh, one to three milliseconds, and that is of course dependent upon the number of devices in the ring. If you, you know, that our published limit's 50, but if you were to go beyond 50, you definitely would see that convergence time impacted by that. And then stack-wise is more your layer three. So again, all the everything we talked about here was just all layer two, and then stack-wise is a layer three um, uh, resiliency protocol, and HSRP, which I think stands for Hot Standby Resiliency Protocol, is also at the layer three. So DLR, simple. It's a uh, it's a fault tolerant ring, um, device to device. So pretty much. A lot of the, you know, most of the Rockwell products have the ability of DLR built in, like uh, Ethernet cards and panel views and remote I/O products. So again, you could daisy chain device to device to device. If there's a situation where you don't have a second port available, a DLR port, then you can use an eTap to um, to add a device to the ring. So the so we said, uh, you know, the advantages are simple. Um, they're resilient, but to a single point of failure. So that's one of the, you know, one of the things to think about on a DLR. So it's the fastest recovery time, but again, you're only good to a single point of failure on a network. And we said a minute ago about the the ETAP, right? So um, in the past, you know, if you had to bring that ring up to another layer, you would probably would have had to ETAP into it and then bring it up to another switch. But like we we said earlier, when we introduced the 5700, you can get a DLR capable 5700, and now I could bring that switch right into the ring itself, and I could take that data now and and kind of you know it's like a, acting as a gateway up to a uh, to a distribution switch perhaps. We showed the faceplate uh, before, but there's one you know one more picture of it. So it gives you all the diagnostics of your ring. You could put that right on your panel view, bring it into an SC application. Uh, you could see the, all the devices in the ring. You see their status. You get the little crown symbol. So he is the uh, supervisor node, and it even shows you the one and the two, the crown with the little one and two. That kind of shows you, you know, who's next to take over and then who's behind him to take over in case the uh, node supervisor, um, supervisor node were to go away. All right, spanning tree protocol. Uh, like we said before, this is kind of what it looks like. It's built into all the Stratix products um, from 2500 all the way up to the 5410, and it's really designed to help uh, you know loop-free networks. But again, like we said before, uh, it has to go out and map the network, and then if uh, something were to go down, it has to go remap the network. So therefore, it's very very slow to to recover. Ether channel. Um, is a is not necessarily a resiliency protocol, but it's used in in resilient uh, design. 
And the idea of ether channel, real quick, is that uh, it's usually it's, it's a redundant star topology, and it kind of shares. So you actually use two connections from between the switches, and it actually will um, divide that traffic evenly between those two ports. If one port go, were to go down, then all traffic switches over to the um, to the other uh, connection, other other line. And then whenever uh, whenever and then, and then so after the disruption, when you get recovered, then it goes back to splitting traffic between the two lines. So it's good. It's probably not the the best. Um, be, you know, flex length is probably the better way to go. But there are some situations where you have to go with ether channel based on the switch you're using uh, and what you're connecting to. And there is an example where they do use ether channel. Uh, in the uh, back in that MCC, IntelliCenter MCC example, they do use Ether channel in this case. So our original drawing did not show two connections; it only showed one. But if you wanted two connections to those switches, then um, the way how our our um, IntelliCenter team is doing it is is actually with an Ether channel. We've done a star topology. Flex links is kind of what we would probably see use mainly in a lot of these resiliency applications. Um, it, this is a Cisco technology, so I should have said Ether Channel and um, STP span tree are IEEE standards, so they're not you know, unique to Cisco. FlexLinks is a Cisco technology. Uh, it's redundant star. It's built into the, uh, again, to the, all the managed Stratix products, not into the 2500, but from the 5700 on up. Um, and the way how FlexLinks works differently is, is it, it's two connections down, but one is an active port and one is a standby port. So if the active port were to go down, it switches over to the uh, standby port. Then, as you can kind of see in the, the bottom diagram, uh, if there's a disruption, after the disruption, um, the, the one that switched over to active stays active, and, if, and when the, the disruption port comes back, it is now the standby port. So um, how we see this deployed is um, to kind of going back to this campus model we showed earlier. So typically, to make this happen, we're looking at a 5410 at, that, uh, at the top layer and 5700, and again, with the full features, you know, the light and the full, so you need the full feature 5700 to have flex links capability to go back up to the 5410. Um, last is Resilient Ethernet Protocol, or the REP, which is the, a REP ring. Uh, this is, again, a, a Cisco uh, technology. And this is basically a way to build a ring. So we showed the DLR, right, which is how we could do a ring with our own equipment, uh, no switches. The rep is how you do it as a switch, right? So a switch level ring. Um, so it's a, it's a segment, you know, from you go from switch port to switch port, you create a ring. The diagram here kind of does a good job. So what happens is you actually have a blocking port. So, uh, at, so it's at somewhere along the ring, there's a, a blocking port. So there's no traffic going between here, uh, where in, this, in the first circle on the left. In the middle, we have a disruption where the red X is. The blocking port gets open, the ring kind of connects. And then at the end, once that uh, segment gets restored, the blocking port now is basically where the disruption was. So that blocking port can kind of move around based on what, what's going on in the ring. So uh, two examples. One's a simple uh, single ring. So uh, single ring, you could use a 5410 or a 5400 at that distribution switch level. And then you can use 5700s um, along the ring for your devices. But if you want to go dual ring, which we're starting to see some people ask for, then you'll be uh, at a 5410 for that distribution switch and a 5700. Um, now, uh, noted here that rep is available in both the light and the full feature 5700. And uh, last but not least for me, before I give the bill for, to wrap this up, um, brand new, 
this will be one of the things you'll see at our mission fair, and uh, I believe it's available. It's in our proposal works today, and that is a new Ethernet card for the control logics, the EN2TP, which is a parallel redundancy protocol module, or the PRP um, module. So what this gives us is one of the questions we always get is, you know, dual media, you know, can I have, can I do dual media um, to my control objects or can I do dual media to my I.O.? Um, but if, with this new PRP module, uh, we'll be able to do dual media from a control logics controller to a control logics um, distributed I.O. chassis. Um, and the best way to explain this is probably just show you some pictures, right? So this is the this is the basic star topology, right? But with the PRP module, we can now basically duplicate our path. So we'll have a LAN A, and we can mirror a LAN B um, right next to it. And now we have two paths from the uh, from the controller down to each of those remote I.O. Uh, or distributed I.O. chassis. Uh, you'll see some, some new acronyms thrown at you. So the DAN, D-A-N, stands for doubly attached node. Um, so what's happening here is, you know, uh, the source DAN sends, sends out the frame over both lands. Whatever one, whatever you know, so the packet goes out both ways. Whichever way it gets there first, that's the one it takes. And then part of that PRP uh, protocol is that it knows that when the second, when the packet comes, the second packet comes in and says, "Hey, you already got you," and it kind of disregards that guy. Um, there's a, a new, another new terminology here it's called the red box. So it's it's not that DVD thing you go to and uh, get your DVDs out in front of you know Win Dixie or whatever. It's a uh, a red box is a term used here to refer to a non a device that can that can bring in non uh, PRP devices into that redundant network. So I can do my uh, I can do my dual LAN to the red box, and then everything underneath the red box is singly attached. And as you can see, they, they another another acronym thrown at us here that's kind of new. Is the the VDAN or the virtually attached virtual doubly attached node? And last but not least is you do have the ability to still bring in what they now another acronym SAN for single singly attached node. So you can still bring a singly attached node into this network. Just that in this app, in this example, I have a I have a panel view tied in on the blue line to that kind of what was LAN A. Well that that is only accessible on LAN A. So LAN B, so if I have some device on LAN B, such as that other panel view, it cannot get to and it cannot see that singly attached node on LAN A. So um, that's kind of how that will work. So there's no bridging between the two LANs, essentially. And um, future capability, so in its initial release here, uh, the redundancy kits for the control logics don't have this capability in, but this will be coming, and I don't have a time frame on that, um, but this will be coming. So we'll be able to do redundant control logics controllers and offer this PRP redundant LAN architecture, um, which will really be pretty nice because it'll help us uh, help us with a lot of um, redundant media uh, specifications that we we definitely see ourselves getting. And uh, that was it for me finally, so I'm going to give it to Bill. He's got two slides, and it will be short and sweet, and then we'll uh, yeah, wrap, <laughs> wrap it up real quick. So I know we, we're going along, so hold on my, hold the noise while I'm getting the mic. Yeah, I'll try and keep it to uh, five minutes or whatever. So you have to... Okay. Hope I didn't go too fast. Yeah, yeah. So, continuing along this line, demystifying Ethernet types. Um, basically, on the very bottom uh, left hand side, different Ethernet categories, going basically from uh, right after 
Alexander Graham Bell, uh, inventing of the telephone wire, uh, basically category three through category seven. There is a category eight that's currently being standardized to coming up with it, but basically I just wanted to go through some of the uh, difference uh, between the between those, especially between the five E, which is the enhanced, and the five uh, and the six. Six uh, A is advanced, but uh, some of the key factors are is that uh, with the five E, um, of course we know we have a hundred meters that we can run the cable. With the uh, six, uh, basic is a little bit uh, larger size wire gauge and it's also twisted a little bit tighter. So that causes the signal to uh, noise ratio to be higher. So you can use it in, uh, <laughs> in some places where you might have some EMI interference a little bit better. Um, so and then at the top is basically showing what the physical cable wiring would look like. Uh, and then basically from 5E does have unshielded and shielded with it. Um, so with Rockwell, um, ab.com backslash networks backslash media backslash ethernet is a very good uh, source to get the information about Rockwell's uh, connected uh, products. Um, another one is uh, Proposal Works and Integrated Architecture Builder, uh, which actually helps in uh, finding out what your uh, RPIs will be. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, within Rockwell we have the essential components uh, catalog uh, which deals with uh, there's six different segments actually one of the segments is connectivity so it has I don't know why this is not moving it has the uh, um, yeah so <laughs> no problem device net media but it also has the uh, Ethernet media so Rockwell has a com pretty much a complete line of, of Ethernet uh, media. Unshielded, twisted pair, shielded, twisted pair. Uh, one of the uh, key factors that uh, Rockwell has come out with is a, a 600 volted rated um, cable. That's actually under the 5E. Um, but that's really good for using in uh, uh, applications where you can run it in cable trays or in MCCs. Um, so you don't have to have a segregated um, way for it to go. You can run it right next to high power cables. Um, Rockwell also has, especially within one of the considerations is not to use commercial uh, rated uh, cable, but industrial rated cable. And Rockwell has a lot of different ways of, of accomplishing this. Uh, some of it is through uh, means of uh, M12 connectors. That's especially where you have IP67 rated areas that you want to uh, keep it maintained, um, but they have spools of wire so you can custom make it and then uh, at various attachments such as the IDC connectors, uh, those are CAT6 rated uh, and within it you don't need a crimping tool whereas with the, uh, uh, the smaller rated uh, you can, uh, you have to use the crimping uh, tool. You can get them with a uh, right hand, left hand so uh, application connector that's especially useful where uh, you have close tight doors or something like that um, but uh, so those are, that's ten of the key factors that I wanted to present uh, basically um, so if you have any any questions about it you can contact me uh, there's a selection guide industrial ethernet media selection guide that actually goes through uh, some of the various factors. You might want to, for instance, uh, what uh, on the demystifying between the uh, the distributed and the core, you might want to uh, think about putting in your CAT6 in that area and use the CAT5E uh, in the lower areas because CAT6 would be good for your backbone uh, applications. So I'm going to jump into, are there any questions online or in-house. Yep, um, online just feel free to type in a question or raise your hand um, if you have one and uh, we'll give everybody a minute to do that and then uh, again we ran a few minutes late so our apologies. 
was all that automation fair stuff in the beginning that took away time there. Any questions in the room? Okay. Um, well, as always, you can reach out to us afterwards. Uh, appreciate everyone's uh, time to join in today, as always, and um, and we'll uh, send out the uh, send out the, the links with the the slide decks and a lot of reference material that we you know we threw a lot of reference material out there to you. So we'll have a lot of that in our uh, again in our on our kind of our show notes on our blog site that we'll so we'll send out to you guys. And with that. Um, have a good afternoon and uh, enjoy the beautiful weather. And uh, we hope to see you in Houston in three weeks. All right, thanks.